think it's time to jump into it. We've got a lot to cover, and I want to make sure we save lots of time for conversations, questions, answers. Um, so welcome so much this morning to our wildfire webinar. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled today to introduce you to Janice Lamb Snyder with the Sacramento Metro Air Quality Management Districts, uh, Bill Hayes from Boulder County Public Health, and Jennifer DeWinter from Sonoma Tech. Um, really thank you again, all three of you for joining us today. Um, really, really excited about the conversations we've got ahead of ourselves. And next slide, please, Theo. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Sean O'Hara. I lead business development and partnerships with Clarity Movement. Um, so we have a quick agenda today, really um, a few introductory presentations from our fantastic panelists. And then we really wanted to save as much time as possible for discussions and Q&A. So again, please do submit questions through the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, we're hoping to take some of your questions um, throughout at the end um, as much as possible. So really looking forward to working through those together. So just jumping in, setting the stage for the conversation, a lot of this I think we're unfortunately very well familiar with. Um, over the last several years, we've seen increasing amounts and intensities of wildfire. Um, this is a trend that is unfortunately on the rise and go figure with climate, this is kind of what we anticipate. It's also, I think as many of you are aware, and as we've seen some, some of the questions and comments from the registrants, this is not just a west coast of California or Northern California. This is smoke covering the country. It doesn't matter if you're in Texas, you can be affected by Alberta. It doesn't matter where you happen to be. Um, we know that this is not limited um, to geographies that are traditionally associated with wildfire, uh, really seeing huge transboundary impacts of smoke these days. Next slide, please. Uh, further, this is being exacerbated by climate once again. Unfortunately, here in the West Coast, well, fortunately, unfortunately, while we're in the middle of a drought, this is not just correlating with drought. In fact, from the insurance perspectives and others, we unfortunately see that these mega fires and wildfires are correlating with rainfall, um, which is accelerating the growth of fuel loads, et cetera, and challenging forest management. And then finally, you know, there is no longer a fire season. Um, unfortunately, as Bill will share with some of the experiences of the Marshall Fire, um, these are starting in December, January. We don't have a smoke season, even, you know, or a wildfire season in many ways. So really something that we're now looking at this, not just as a summer and fall thing, but how do we actually manage and respond to these types of challenges on a year round basis, um, keep ourselves prepared for such. So without any kind of further ado, my goal again to speak as little as possible today, I'd be happy to turn it over to Janice um, to kick us off with a great presentation about the work at Sacramento. So thanks so much. Great, thank you, Sean. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Does everybody see my screen? All right, great. Well, uh, thank you, Sean, for the introduction. Um, my name is Janice Lime Snyder, and I am with the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Manage Management District. Um, and today, what I really wanted to do was to share a few projects that we've um, worked on at the Sacramento Air District on um, how we proactively take an approach to prepare for wildfire season. Um, to orient uh, folks who are on the webinar today, um, who, you know, who and wh where we are, we are located in California, um, Sacramento, California, and you see that red um, star there. Uh, California has uh, 35 air districts. And um, unlike uh, different other states in, uh, in the nation, um, we're broken up into air districts where we have responsibilities for uh, air monitoring, um, stationary source development of uh, rules. We also do permitting enforcement, uh, develop air quality plans, uh, CEQA commenting, which is a California version of uh, NEPA. Uh, we also implement incentive programs as well as responsible for air quality, creating air quality awareness and outreach in our communities. So like Sean had just, um, you know, briefly talked about, um, Cal uh, you know, wildfire, there is really no wildfire season anymore. Um, we've experienced wildfires throughout, uh, throughout the year. And but, you know, for us in Sacramento, where we've seen, a, you know, 
increase in frequency in wildfires has been in the last, you know, decade, especially in the last, you know, five to six years. And these are just examples of the large wildfires and the smoke impact that comes with it um, that we as a regulatory agency uh, really have to deal with in terms of public awareness and public outreach. So as a regulatory agency, um, we have to establish um, from the EPA uh, a monitoring network um, that really was built to monitor for criteria pollutants and um, from the EPA. And there was, you know, there are stringent requirements for where we're going to put it, what type of equipment we're going to use, how you're going to quality control and quality assure it, how we're going to report the results. And typically they're focused on certain objectives like air quality, air quality planning. And, um, and so we have uh, seven uh, monitoring stations um, in just the city uh, or just the county of Sacramento. And uh, we operate six, uh, six of them and the state uh, operates one of them. So when I think about how to prepare for a wild a wildfire smoke impacts, um, I think it's important for us to uh, proactively think about what the objectives are. Like, what are we trying to achieve with getting the data? And I think about this um, holistically. I think about it, what do we need during, you know, during the event? And what do we need after event? And what I have realized is that not any one method really covers all of, you know, all of the object objectives that we want. So we really have to use different types of tools to piece together everything that we need um, to make a really robust air monitoring network. So what are some of the essentials that you need for a monitoring program during a wildfire event? Um, you know, first and foremost, our objective is to create public awareness so that people are making informed decisions about what to do during, um, what the air quality is like during an air, um, uh, air pollution event. And so one of the things that are really important is to make sure that you have real-time information. So it's, you know, the data is time sensitive. Um, do you have a network that meets air, qual uh, air quality forecasting needs? Um, do you have a spatial coverage? A lot of the public and the community is asking questions. And you saw you know, the map that I showed earlier where we had six monitoring stations, but people really want to know, you know, what is the air quality in my neighborhood? What is it in my community? What is it in my child's school? You know, what is it, um, where, what, what is the air quality like for my employees, our outdoor workers exposure? And, you know, so it's important to ensure you have that spatial coverage to disseminate that information. Um, and then uh, one other point, important point is data access. Um, is the information that you're collecting easy to get to, um, easy to communicate, and is this going to be easily understandable by the public? So in order to reduce um, public exposure to air pollution events, um, you know, sensors have really come a long way and they do really do provide a uh, level of local information that is tangible for the public. What, you know, what they need to know during an event is, is the air quality good? Is it unhealthy? Is it, you know, very unhealthy? What should I do with that? And, um, and that, you know, a group of those can help supplement a regulatory network that, you know, we also manage um, and or some of the modeling inf information that, you um, uh, that you'll also have. Um, so I'll give an example of that in just the next slide. And then what I'm going to talk about is that data needs to be coupled with action. So a program is only half the program when you have the data. And um, the other half is what the community, um, what information the community will have so that they know what actions to take to protect themselves, to protect their family, their employees, and, uh, and just you know, their community members in general. 
So the first project that I'm going to talk about that we launched in partnership with the city of Sacramento is um, we set up a program to distribute, uh, originally it was 100 sensors within the city of Sacramento. And um, we really, uh, because of the demand uh, that we saw with the city, we were able to um, work that we, to, to, to distribute 200 of these sensors within the city. And on the map that you see, uh, the outline is the city of Sacramento where you see that it's mostly um, distributed. And we, uh, you know, opened it up to uh, residences, businesses, we worked with schools in the city of Sacramento, and we really prioritize uh, high need areas. And so where you see the red areas are the higher need areas in Sacramento, in the north, in the south, and um, uh, within, the, within the city boundaries. And so now that we have the data, um, we need to couple that with the information, uh, information to the public. And our air district has developed uh, a few communication tools that we are actively promoting in the community um, on what community members could do. It's like, hey, what do you do during a wild smi wildfire smoke event? And there's five steps, right? Find out what your air quality is. Use this air quality chart, make your plan, communicate it. Um, and we've done that for uh, the general public. We've done that for the businesses, the schools. And then we have general information about like things that uh, people might want to refrain from, um, from doing during a smoke event. And all this uh, information is available on our website if you wanted to take a look later. This is an example of the action charts that um, I was just talking about earlier. So when you have the information, you want to be able to give um, the community what they're supposed, you know, what you would like for them to do, you know, to change their behavior. And um, like I said, we have this for the general public, uh, school businesses, public agencies, and you can find all of this in our uh, on our website listed on the slide. And so those are things that I think about um, during a wildfire event. And, um, but there are lots of things that as a regulatory agency that we have to think about after the event. And um, accuracy details evidence of like the smoke impact is, uh, is important to have. And so how do you prepare a network to do that? Um, you know, first, you know, you have to think about like, how does this impact the attainment of our health standards? Um, what information do I need to support an exceptional event request? Uh, what information do I need other than PM 2.5? Do you need meteorological data? Do you need wind direction? Um, do you need other types of pollutants to support that the wild, uh, that there was actually a wildfire smoke that um, that has occurred? And potentially that might be, you know, carbon monoxide, uh, black carbon, PM 10. Um, and then also using, you know, different tools like such as satellite data that could be also used to prove that this event um, actually happened. Um, and a lot of health experts in the public now are asking about toxics. You know, they're moving away from just what is the smoke impact from 2.5, um, but they're really, because, you know, it's not just wood burning, there's, you know, communities and, and, and buildings um, that are uh, that are, you know, caught in these wildfires now. And so lots of uh, health experts are asking about, you know, what are some of the toxic impacts to, um, uh, from these wildfire smoke events. And so one of the uh, examples that I have, um, this is from the campfire back in 2018, it was one of the deadliest wildfires in California history. Um, and it caused a lot of violations of the federal health standards of uh, PM, upwards of uh, 200 micrograms um, meters cubed uh, in Sacramento. And so we, in order for us to, um, you know, show that there 
that um, this particular event happened, we used a variety of information to tell a compelling story. We used sensors to show the behavior of the smoke moving towards Sacramento. We used reference grade monitors, like I said, PM, you know, black carbon uh, meteorology um, sensors and uh, CO and uh, carbon monoxide. We used modeling information, weather descriptions, everything that we could use, um, we threw uh, in there to tell that compelling story that it did have impact and it wasn't something that was controllable for us. And then I'm going to share a last project that we have that really combines, um, shows an example of like different objectives and how you can build that network. Um, in California, there is something called uh, California's Assembly Bill 617, which is the Community Air Protection Program. Uh, this is a program uh, where, you know, it really focuses on community level uh, air quality. And um, it's really designed to work with community members to, you know, prioritize their concerns and um, really think about solutions and strategies to reduce the exposure and the burden on that community. And so one of the communities that we have is in South Sacramento, Florin, uh, which is uh, the purple um, circle that I have. And you can see here that it didn't, you know, that area doesn't have, you know, a, a, a reference site station there. Um, and so we had to think about like what to build um, based on their priorities. And here's just a quick slide on, um, you know, some of the concerns that the South Sacramento flooring community came up with. You know, one of the main things that they sp um, shared with us uh, in the very beginning of one of our meetings was that um, they re really felt like their community needed to increase the education outreach efforts into the minority population in their in the community. Um, and while and the example that they gave was wildfire smoke. They saw kids walking to and from school practices um, that were occurring during this really high smoke event. And so that was an indicator to them that you know the community really wasn't aware. And so, and then other uh, objectives such as you know understanding what the emissions um, from highways and businesses and how does that impact, uh, impact their air pollution burden. And so there's really a immediate need of like air quality awareness, creating that. And then let's also learn about like, what are the sources, a longer term, you know, what are the sources that are impacting us? And so we took a three-phased approach, which is um, we put out 21 sensors in the community, and those are indicated by the blue dots. Uh, the areas that are colored were priority areas that they came up with um, that they you know, wanted us to focus our monitoring efforts with. And then what we did was that we took, um, we did additional toxics measurements um, at six locations to help inform where we were gonna put a fixed site uh, station for up to six months to a year. And this is what it looks like if you wanna look at it from a picture point of view where we had sensors out into the community, then these were the six um, uh, enhanced monitorings. And now we have a portable station, um, portable laboratory that we put into the, um, into the community to really learn about like the um, the learn learn more about like what actually is most impacting the community, the mission sources that are impacting the community. And so um, the last and I think what I'll uh, leave us with in ter terms of building an air monitoring work network is that we really need to use you know all of the tools that we have to um, build a network that can meet immediate needs you know, post needs and not, you know, not just focus on one, but use all of um, all of the tools that we can. So I think that's it. Here's my contact information. If you have more info, uh, if you need, have more questions and I will pass it back to Sean. Janice, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. Having even seen it a couple of times and just something new sticks out every time, particularly communication in this case that, you know, all the data in the world you can collect. If you're not communicating it to the public properly, you're not providing guidance, um, you can really be lost. Without any further ado, I'd love to jump over to Bill Hayes with Boulder County to 
get another perspective. Unfortunately, some other challenges with wildfire affecting a different community, um, but also handled extremely, extremely well. Um, so over to you, Bill, and thank you so much for joining us. Got to get you off mute too. Yeah, I was furiously clicking the button and it wasn't happening. Thank you, Sean. And uh, uh, thank you, Janice. That was a great presentation. And I am definitely going to be going to your website and uh, downloading all of the information <laughs> that you have there. Some really great public messaging. Um, you know, one of the things Janice hit on is uh, folks wanting to know air quality really at the neighborhood level and uh, wanting to know about toxics from the wildfire. And both of those apply in the case I'm going to talk to. Before I jump into it, I was just looking though at the chat and Wow, we've got people from Ghana, India, Sri Lanka, Nigeria, Bogota, United Kingdom. Um, you know, Sean started out by saying that wildfire smoke isn't just a California West Coast phenomena, it's the whole country. Well, obviously it's, it's the world. So uh, without further ado, I'll jump in. Uh, again, Bill Hayes, and I'm the Air Quality Coordinator at Boulder County Public Health. And so for our international friends, um, Boulder is uh, right on the western edge of the Rocky Mountains, kind of middle of the, the country. And so we have a lot of forested area in our state. So we've got our own wildfire problems in the state, um, but we get wildfire smoke from California. And two weeks ago, we had some incredibly bad wildfire uh, smoke conditions that came down from Canada. Um, so. I'm going to talk about uh, an incident that happened in December 2021, uh, but want to preface that with, uh, you know, as I said, in Colorado, we are no strangers to wildfires. And in 2020 was the worst wildfire season um, on record for Colorado on the basis of acres burned. Um, we simultaneously had the Cameron Peak and the East Troublesome fires going together. They burned um, over 400,000 acres of land. And then um, that same uh, year in the autumn in Boulder County, we had a fire that uh, burned 10,000 acres and really um, blanketed uh, most of the cities in Boulder County with a really thick layer of smoke. Um, but on December 30th, 2021, we had a, a fire breakout in uh, Boulder County and it was a grass fire. Uh, grass burns very quickly, but not typically uh, at a very high temperature. Uh, but we had winds that day topping 100 miles an hour and it just moved that fire faster than any containment could be provided. And um, we're using the term uh, urban wildland interface a lot these days because that's what happened. We're, one of the things that um, you know, makes Boulder County a wonderful place to live is that we have a lot of open space that has been purchased by the county, by cities that can never be developed. Um, and that's very desirable place to be near. So we've got housing communities built right up against the edge of that wildland. And so this grass fire uh, took off, it was moving, um, you know, there was estimates the fire line was moving at 60 miles an hour with those winds. It hit the Western edge of uh, Louisville and Superior, Colorado. And once structures were ignited, it just became um, completely uncontrollable. And in about a 12 hour period of time, over 1000 homes were destroyed. Um, the, the most miraculous part of this fire though, was that we only had two deaths. And uh, then 24 hours later, the snow started coming down and uh, extinguished the fire uh, pretty quickly. And so, um, because of that, uh, even though a thousand homes were destroyed, it was in the area with about 10,000 homes. So people were very anxious to get back into their homes just days after that fire went out. And the big question that everyone was asking is, what am I breathing? Is it safe? Because, you know, there were still smoldering ashes everywhere. There was, you know, smell of the burnt plastics, the other burnt uh, synthetic materials. And, you know, when they ask us, what am I breathing? Is it safe? We really didn't know. You know, historically, we know uh, the, the common constituents of wildfire smoke. But since uh, we had uh, so many structures, automobiles, other man-made objects burn, you know, as Janice said, 
toxins were really the concern. And uh, so I jump past that. And so um, our existing monitors in Boulder County, you can see now off the, the screenshot from Air Now, uh, those three green dots are all uh, state of Colorado operated air monitoring stations that uh, monitor for PM and ozone. And our, our uh, predominant winds are west to east. So from this picture from the left side to the right side is the predominant wind direction. The, gr the uh, red triangle is essentially the burn area of the fire. And so as you can see, the, the monitoring that we had in place was mostly upwind and outside of the burn area. So that wasn't really helpful in telling us uh, what people were breathing in that uh, area. Uh, we're very fortunate in Boulder County that we have a number of federal labs, uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, headquarters is in Boulder County, and they called us up immediately and said, what can we do to help? Uh, this van that's pictured here, uh, it's packed full of instrumentation. It's, it's uh, you know several hundred thousand dollars worth of air monitoring equipment packed into this van. Um, they're able to take some real-time measurements with the van. They're able to take uh, capture samples, go back to the lab and analyze afterwards. They drove every single road in the burn area. And uh, this uh, slide uh, is showing just results for benzene, but they had about 150 uh, um, compounds that they were looking at. And so you can see the graph at the top uh, with the red spikes, pink and blue, that the uh, red spikes were, you know, they noted it was when they drove past the structure that was still smoldering. Um, and then as, as that graph goes from pink to blue, blue is the evening, the winds calmed down, and so aren't pushing the pollutants out as quickly. And you can see the kind of the baseline levels of all of those went up. Uh, but they didn't find anything that was in the uh, acutely concerning levels, which was good news. They repeated this process two weeks later and all of the constituents had gone down significantly. Um, I, I threw this slide in, uh, Sean, uh, sorry at the last minute, but when Janice mentioned toxins, I wanted to make sure folks knew that, you know, we looked at those as well. Uh, but so the, the, the big step that we took at Boulder County Public Health immediately after the fire was getting our hands on some uh, portable particulate monitors. We've got colleagues down in the city of Denver that about six years ago got a Bloomberg grant and created what they call the Love My Air system, where they put um, clarity monitors in schools throughout Denver and then uh, put up a website, put monitors in the schools so that children coming to school can see you know, what the air pollution is today. Should I go out at recess? Should I stay in? Um, and then a website that their parents can look at to see what the air quality of the school is. Uh, the, the program's won many awards. It's really well done. And so you know, uh, I am the day after the fire called up uh, Michael Ogletree, who was at Denver then and said, Michael, do you have some spare monitors lying around? And they had eight sitting in a closet in various states of operation. We Frankenstein six and got them out just days after the fire. So uh, this slide, uh, the inset at the bottom shows the uh, Clarity S node monitor. And no, I'm not a paid spokesman for Clarity, but I'm impressed with the product. And this is about the size of a loaf of bread. If you're not familiar with it, I think they weigh in about two and a half pounds. Solar panels, uh, uh, roughly uh, eight by 10. And so they're very portable. Um, you know, just a couple of zip ties attach this to the post. And because it's uh, solar powered, I, I've been really impressed with the battery life on these monitors and they transmit data via cellular network. That means we could put these monitors any place the sun shines and any place that you can make a cell call. Um, so, you know, we put these throughout the community in places like this, playgrounds where people were going to be outside recreating and concerned, you know, about their health and, of course, particularly about their children's health. Uh, in the uh, left hand side of the screen is the internal dashboard that uh, Clarity provides. And so, you know, I'm able to see where each one of my monitors is. The color of the dot tells me, you know, what air quality it's currently recording. I can then click on any one of those individual monitors to get more information. Uh, we ended up ordering additional monitors and had a total of 26 monitors 
in this burn area. And this burn area was about 6,000 acres. And so 22 monitors for an area that size is complete and absolute overkill. And that's exactly what we wanted because you know we had a lot of people very nervous and we wanted to be able to provide them with information. And as Jana said, at neighborhood level. This also came into play when the uh, debris and removal process began because now we had heavy equipment going in, um, demolishing, uh, hauling away debris from destroyed houses while right next door to that house was an intact house where um, someone was was living. It was really amazing when you looked at how this fire jumped. Uh, we hear this with tornadoes all the time, uh, but the fire, because it was mostly spread by embers blowing that some houses, the embers landed on, they had a new roof, it didn't burn, the next house completely to the ground. So um, you have people living very close to the debris removal activities. So knowing at that street level um, what the air quality was really helped us uh, assure that people weren't being um, overly adversely impacted by the health uh, effects of the fire. Um, you know, there's no way that we could tell anyone that they were 100% safe, but this, you know, told us uh, enough to know if uh, we should be telling people to stay out of the area or not. Uh, so the Love My Air platform that Denver created, as I said, they had an existing website and uh, we were able to just add a page to their website. They allowed us to put our own uh, Marshall Fire and Boulder County Public Health logos on it. So these green dots are all of the monitors that we put in the burn area. Um, we put eight of those monitors on schools in the um, burn area because we have a lot of uh, children that go to school in the burn area but live outside of the burn area. And so parents wanted to know if it was safe to send their children to those schools. Um, our funding has recently uh, run out and we've uh, removed all of our monitors from the burn area, Boulder County Public Health, but we've worked with the Boulder Valley School District to maintain eight monitors in the burn area on those schools. And again, that's that's more than adequate coverage. So I'm really glad that you know we're not just walking away and having no data, but now that the debris removal process is uh, completely finished, um, our concerns are much lower. And so we're scaling back and we're not gonna have as many clarity monitors, but they've, they've really proven their use. And so we're gonna be redeploying them in other parts of the county. We're gonna be putting them in low income neighborhoods, manufactured home communities to make sure that those um, areas aren't being disproportionately impacted with poor air quality. We have a large cement plant that has uh, a lot of concerns that we're gonna be putting um, monitors around that. We're also looking uh, in Boulder County and uh, the Front Range of Colorado, we have very high ozone levels. And uh, so I've got four brand new on the way um, air monitors coming from Clarity with ozone sensors. And we're going to be able to look at how the ozone transports from um, Boulder, which is more or less the plains, up the uh, foothills and into the mountains. Uh, so this is just one more slide of that website that if you uh, clicked on any one of those monitors, it would tell you what it's currently reading and give you advice. Uh, this was a good day, so go outside and play. But if it got into the orange and red, it would be having additional messaging such as uh, Janice was showing for folks. Um, one of the things I really liked about it was the ability to send alerts. Uh, so we had um, about 4,500 people sign up for alerts, uh, both text and email. They could choose three different monitors to uh, get alerts from, and they could choose at what point they got the alert. So was it when air quality went from um, good to moderate, or did they wanna wait till it went from moderate to unhealthy before they got an alert? Uh, one thing we found out in the first week was we needed to shut it off at night because people didn't like getting alerts at 2 a.m. Um, so I uh, through that as fast as I could to try to save time for questions. Uh, so uh, thank you all. And again, I'm really impressed with the worldwide uh, attendance today. Uh, and, uh, my contact information, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me directly if you have questions after. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bill. I mean, again, powerful presentation. And it, it is such a miracle after that fire that only two lives were lost. I just, you know, again, quite a blessing and you know sad as it is it's still just very fortunate in so many ways all right
well, moving in a slight sidestep from the perspectives of kind of communities and cities and government agencies. I'm very pleased to welcome Jennifer DeWinter, our partners at Sonoma Technology, um, to introduce one of the additional tools, um, kind of as Bill and Janice both suggested, you know, air quality management, I often compare it to an orchestra. It's a bunch of instruments working together in huge amounts of human coordination that make these things successful. Um, so really excited for Jennifer to introduce some of the new innovative tools and technologies um, that they're working on at Sonoma Tech. So over to you, Jennifer. Great, thanks, Sean. And uh, Bill, could I ask you to stop your share and then I'll take over there. While we get that going, I'll just introduce myself and thank you all for joining again. My name is Jennifer D. Winter and I'm the Vice President of Product Management for Sonoma Technology. And I've been with STI for 15 years and have spent uh, most of my career um, working on developing software systems and products. And I've worked heavily with EPA over the years on Air Now and um, other, other tools. And most recently, I've been leading the development of Exact AQ, which is a um, new product of ours that I'm going to be sharing about today. Hopefully, you can see my screen now. Um, so, first off, I wanted to uh, give a little bit of background. Um, and as you have heard already and may be aware, you know, the past um, 10 to 20 years have seen um, an increase in the number and the size of fires, including, you know, large catastrophic fires in the West, like we've been hearing about, and as well as, you know, small and medium-sized fires elsewhere in the country. Um, and the air pollution from these fires is, is significant and, you know, has been modeled to contribute anywhere from, um, you know, five to half the PM 2.5, um, especially during the summer months. And it's it's complex and can change rapidly and, and definitely varies over um, small spatial scales. And uh, during these events, you know, many decisions arise such as, you know, personal choices about outdoor activity, um, organizational decisions about schools or athletic events. And so real-time community scale air quality information is, is pretty critical for decision-making during smoke events. And the, you know, it's our opinion that the accuracy and the resolution of many existing real-time data products to um, inform those decisions that predict air quality conditions during smoke events can be improved. Um, and, you know, I say that because many of the, you know, air quality public reporting products can be coarse in spatial and temporal resolution, and they can lack spatial coverage. So you have people living in areas that, you know, we don't necessarily have a monitor. And, um, and then you also have situations where um, there's information available from different sources. And so that puts the public in a position to work to, you know, interpret what could be inconsistencies um, between what's out there. And so, you know, in response to that, um, Sonoma Technology has been working to develop a new product called Exact AQ, um, which provides an information service for um, high resolution, accurate estimates of historical, current, and forecast air quality. And Exact AQ is um, a pretty advanced air quality data and forecasting system that provides community scale information um, in real time. And uh, each hour, Exact AQ generates um, gridded maps at one kilometer spatial scale of the latest air quality conditions, as well as um, we do hourly forecasts going out 48 hours. And uh, the Exact AQ models use data from reference grade monitors and sensors, such as you know the really valuable data um, collected in the networks that Janice and Bill spoke about. And then we also use um, the information from fire and smoke models that are available and, and other data sources. We really try to you know, leverage the strengths of each one and you know, reduce uncertainty so that we can offer a complete spatial map and, and picture about air quality um, you know, for organizations and the public. And you see a, a map here on this screen, which is um, just from earlier in May, um, showing a, an hour in which um, there was significant smoke pollution across a lot of the country from some of these large fires that were burning in Canada that, that many of you may be aware of. So um, this is an example of the, the exact AQ uh, results. Um, and so now I'm going to share um, Exact AQ as applied to um, two different uh, case studies. And the first is a, a pretty significant fire and smoke event that occurred during September of 2022. 
And so um, in this map, which came from Air Now Tech, um, you can see um, the fire locations of uh, the red triangles. And that shows that there were just many different fires um, that were burning during this time and large, um, pretty large swaths of smoke um, in, in the region that are shown in gray. And uh, so during a, a sample hour here that's shown in, in these three images, um, there was pretty widespread smoke emissions taking place throughout the Northwest. Um, and you can see that um, with the you know, areas of smoke identified in the middle image by the hazard mapping system or HMS. And on the left, you can see um, visually um, the exact AQ representation of, of the smoke during this hour and um, that it's you know, pretty realistically represented throughout the domain. And there's you know, good visual agreement here between exact AQ um, and HMS smoke density with you know, areas of high concentrations in you know, red and purple um, aligning with the areas of dense smoke that are shown here in the HMS. And um, on the right here, we're just comparing that to um, the NOAA National Air Quality Forecast Capability, or NAQFC, which is a, a widely used air quality forecast and is um, an underlying data source that ExactAQ leverages. Um, but uh, in, in this e example hour, NAQFC is, is predicting only uh, moderate PM2.5 concentrations through um, a lot of this region. And so um, on this slide now, you can see a, a graphical comparison of, of our exact AQ model results um, on, on the y-axis here um, to observe concentrations at air now monitor shown on the x-axis. And this is during the same uh, multi-week smoke event that occurred in September of, of last year. And um, you know, as shown in the plot here on the left, um, quantitatively, exact AQ shows um, good agreement with reference monitor measurements. And we found in a, you know, especially strong correlation during, um, during, you know, hours with smoke impacts. And overall, the, um, the error in exact AQ was reduced by about 10 micrograms as compared to um, any QFC and, and, and its, um, its correlation to the air now reference stations. And okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch gears a little bit now and show a second application of Exact AQ, which is um, actually during a controlled burn that occurred in Monterey Co County, California, um, over a two-day period um, last October. And so um, in this area, Exact AQ models were able to incorporate data from the Clarity nodes that are part of the network that um, was set up and and is managed by the Monterey Bay Air Resources District. And so just a, a little orientation here on this map: um, San Jose is up here. Um, here's Santa. Cruz, Cruz, Salinas, and um, this controlled burn um, occurred on, on some private lands here um, performed by CAL FIRE um, to the, the east of Salinas. And, um, and then you can see the clarity nodes shown as triangles. Um, and a number of them were, were situated along um, Highway 101 here in the, in the cities that, that are um, found along this, this major freeway. Um, and uh, the Monterey Bay uh, district cited these to, you know, complement the rest of, of their monitoring network, but um, to, to make sure that they did have some monitoring in these places that, that don't have other, other monitors um, available. Now I'm just going to play a quick animation of 24 hours of this, this controlled burn event and, and show you how the smoke impacted um, really all these these um, populated towns along this freeway. And so exact AQ was able to, to really represent these smoke impacts from the burn, especially the smoke that that hit those cities um, and you know was was captured by the clarity nodes. And you know, again, there there weren't other monitors available. So it was really valuable to be able to combine the data from clarity with the uh, the other data sources that exact AQ pulls in. Um, so uh, exact AQ is available in, in a couple of different ways. We have a dashboard with an interactive map where you can view all the latest model results and forecasts and underlying data sources. We also have an API and other mapping services to plug in exact AQ maps to existing websites. Since, you know, as we've heard, getting information to the public during these events is, is really critical. And so we're trying to make, you know, that, that really accessible for you to, you know, kind of seamlessly integrate a map like exact AQ. Um, and then we also... Um, have you know other map layers that kind of thing that that can be integrated. 
And so um, just kind of to, to wrap us up here, um, in conclusion, you know, we've developed Exact AQ to, to meet needs from organizations for air quality information at high spatial and temporal resolution, um, especially during these smoke events. Um, our data pipeline use, uses, a, you know, many different data sources and methods to combine them. And so um, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Please, you know, contact me if you're interested to, um, you know, start a pilot um, to incorporate data from your clarity nodes or other measurements um, that you may have. And I do want to um, thank and acknowledge our data providers, um, Clarity, Purple Air, Air Now, NOAA, um, among others, and then also the, the Monterey Bay Air Resources District for, for giving us access to um, the data from their Clarity nodes. And I will also share my uh, contact information and uh, thank you all for your attention today. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Yeah, it's been such a pleasure collaborating on these tools and big thank you to the other partners uh, in board and others who have helped us with this. Um, really, really exciting there. I'd be amiss with my sales team if I didn't mention we are running a promotion right now of some of these solutions around the, the types of monitoring that we've been talking about, both in Sacramento, Boulder Valley. Um, and obviously, these are able to integrate the exact AQ model um, that we just reviewed as well. Um, so if you're interested in this, we do have a hyperlink or a uh, QR code and all this jazz, take a look, um, or you can get in touch with any of the various participants if you're interested in learning more as well. Um, but please don't hesitate um, or post some interest in the uh, chat channel if you'd like us to get in touch directly. So without any further ado, once again, saying that a lot today, apparently, love to jump into the Q&A. So I've marked several different questions, and I'd love to give the panelists just a, a moment to browse through the Q&A as well, see if there's any that they'd like to answer live. Um, and then we can start it off from there. Uh, so let me mark a few in here. Okay, what we've got. All right, so let's see. Where did my list of questions that all want to be answered go here too? All right, well, I see one here from uh, Aza starting right off. Um, so maybe focus this one on Jennifer, but plans around implementing exact AQ in other countries. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for asking that. So we do have exact AQ results available elsewhere in the world um, globally, and we pull in you know different data sources depending on the region to really try and offer you know the most exact you know accurate result um, that we can for for different places. And so that's a combination of of you know sensors and governmental monitors as well as different models that are available elsewhere. So um, I'd be happy to you know talk some more about. Um, a particular area if you're interested. So please do, you know, um, reach out to me and, and we can maybe talk some more offline. But but broadly, you know, for anyone else who might be interested, we do have um, exact AQ models elsewhere. Perfect. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. I have a question here from Teresa Vera talking. Can low-cost sensors be used as a preventative tool to allow quick answers in remote areas? And I'd love to just punt this over, I think, to maybe Bill and Janice for kind of their experiences and maybe the caveats around how to best use LCS in remote areas. Bill, did you want to go first or? I am sorry, but uh, my my unmute button just is really sticky. So yeah, thanks, Janice. Um, you know, I, I think uh, the the big caveat when you're using low cost sensors is that you know these are not regulatory grade equipment, um, but they they are accurate enough to know you know is there a health risk? Do we need to take action? And um, especially for uh, small local municipalities that don't have funding for regulatory grade monitors and, and honestly don't even have the need for a regulatory grade monitor. This is definitely the future. You know, 10 years ago, these devices were not available. And so uh, these low cost sensors are providing us with just a, a wealth of information that we didn't have available to us before. Um, you know, as I said, the, you know, the, the act, the level of uh, precision isn't uh, as robust, but uh, you also need to really compare one manufacturer to another. Um, Jennifer mentioned Purple Air, you know, they have their uses, they have their places, but, you know, it's a completely different product than Clarity. So you really need to understand the benefits and the limitations of each 
uh, different companies' monitors before you just jump in and uh, you know put all your eggs in one basket. And um, you know we're looking at getting uh, monitors from as many different manufacturers as possible so that we can test them and compare them and really figure out which ones are appropriate for what use. And I think um, for us, we also co-locate them with these reference grade monitors so that you know we're able to tell how well they perform, whether or not they have biases. And during a, um, a smoke event, right, what you want to communicate to the public is good, bas bad, good, bad, worse, or, you know, uh, very unhealthy, right? And I think these sensors provide a, a really good source of information for areas don't, that do not have these reference grade monitors. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, really, really helpful. All right, juggling through here, um, let's see. I think this is another great question for um, our kind of government community partners. So Zhou Zhang, thank you so much. When there are discrepancies between AQI, and air monitoring station readings and personal senses, smelling, um, visibility, et cetera, how would you explain such discrepancies to the public? For example, people smell wildfires, see the smoky sky, but the AQI is showing good or moderate and the readings nearby air monitoring stations are still okay. Um, really interesting as we talk about the sensitivities of noses, smells as compared to concentrations, but also the temporal scale as we think about regulatory monitoring versus real-time sensors and rolling averages. Um, love to hear a little bit about your experiences and how you guys have handled similar um, kind of public feedback. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to answer that one because uh, we, we get inundated with this question of how can the air quality be good when I smell smoke? Um, and I've gotten really good at explaining to people that, you know, humans evolved over eons to be really good at smelling smoke because um, that and several other compounds that, you know, are a danger. And so we are really good at smelling smoke. We are really good at smelling hydrogen sulfide, which is why they add that odor to natural gas. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's an immediate threat. So, you know, like I said, that's a, that's a well-practiced speech. Um, but the, the other uh, thing that uh, in, we do have, especially, you know, here in Boulder County, that might be a little different because half of our county is very mountainous and then immediately goes flat to the plains. And we have several canyons coming out of those mountains and they can funnel wildfire smoke so that, uh, you know, I'm here in Boulder uh, population, a little over 100,000. And we've seen times where on the north side of town, the air quality due to wildfire smoke is very unhealthy. And on the south side of town, it's only moderate. Um, and so, again, that's where having these low cost sensors um, to be able to show the uh, difference uh, from just a few miles apart that we can't do with the regulatory grade monitors. I think um, one of the things that we typically try to explain to the public is that, um, you know, some of our regulatory monitors have are on a different time scale. Right, and so when we're collecting information, sometimes it's hourly basis, and maybe they're looking at sensor information that might be real time. And so we try to explain that, you know, there really isn't, um, it's not a one-to-one -one match, um, but it's important that, you know, if they smell it, if they, you know, see information that the air, you know, air pollution is high during that time, then they should be taking action to remove themselves from the smoke. And so, um, and usually that's, you know, I think that in general, that's pretty easy to understand. Um, it just needs a little bit more communication um, about the different types of methods that are used. Great, thank you both for that. It's really, really helpful, I think, um, especially for our audience, who once again, very impressed with, you know, appreciate the global uh, participation today. Um, I have another question here from Robert Belford. Uh, could you describe the current art of integrating satellite data with sensor network data and what resources satellite data are publicly available? I'm looking at HCAST and see they have, uh, or HCAST, re uh, rapid response teams dealing with wildfire. I'm mostly interested in the interplay of these different data sources and what are the issues of satellite data versus sensor data. Um, this is great because uh, the HCAST, I know both Nathan and myself are participating currently, so I'd love to punt this over to Jennifer and our cameo guest Nathan as well, um, depending on who would like to discuss this topic. No, yeah, absolutely. I think Nathan, given your participation in HCAST, it's a great one for you, so uh, I'll turn it over to you. And Nathan, by the way, as introduction is our um, data science lead for ExactAQ, so he's 
the man behind the models here. Um, so uh, I'll give it to you, Nathan. Yeah, great. Uh, well, thanks for the question. I think there's a lot of really exciting progress on um, using satellite data to understand wildfire smoke. Yeah, that my guest is doing is really valuable. Um, there's a product called the NOAA Hazard Mapping System, um, smoke polygons that, that's derived from satellite data. I think um, Jennifer shared that in the slide she had pointed out um, before. And so, and I think there's a lot of exciting directions seeing work um, here. At, you know, HACAST is actively working at, on it as our other researchers. Um, I, I, uh, I'm also working on a on a separate project with with uh, NASA funding to to look at how satellite data can support air quality forecasting, um, and so uh, there's a lot of directions there. There's some challenges that we're continuing to to work through. Cloud cover is one. Understanding where in the vertical column the pollution that you can observe some satellite. There's there's strengths and weaknesses, and I think this kind of goes back to what um, what all the presenters have have shared here is that there's strengths and weaknesses to every one of the data sets that we have. And, and the best solution, I think, is the one that uses all the tools in the toolbox. Um, so I think there's some really, really exciting stuff going on. Thanks for the great question. Great, thank you, Nathan. Yeah, so it's so very true about, again, integrating these solutions. The beautiful spatial scale we get with remote sensing tools, but the need to correct that locally at the ground as compared to colometric measurements, and then how low cost sensors can be tuned back to regulatory. Um, these things really do all work in concert well together. So I have a question here from Akila uh, Jaya Sundara. Um, are the US um, and California or other governments using low cost sensors to display air quality information or to use in government actions such as alerting people? I just searched a little bit in the public air quality information on the web. It's not reveal much or about that. Um, so in long and short, I would say, yes, a number of agencies such as SAC Metro and MBARD, um, the US EPA has a current pilot going with the US Forest Service called the Fire and Smoke Map. So we are seeing non-regulatory applications of sensor data in a variety of different formats. Um, I wouldn't say there's a standard approach to this, and it's actually really interesting as we're all kind of learning how to best suit the public's need around communications in this space. Um, but it's something I would encourage you to contact us or other participants here. Um, lots of different varied experiences, and I think it's an exciting time in the industry as we all share and connect on those. All right, glancing through here, do my panelists see any questions they're particularly burning to answer? If so, please jump in and speak up. I'm conscious of where we are at with time. Um, I'm happy to run a little over, but want to respect people's schedules as much as possible. Please raise a hand if you see anything that you're super excited about answering. I know we've been getting quite a few of these here. We talked a little bit about calibration, the importance of co-locating sensors locally. There is different evaluation programs around the world, but you know, at the end of the day, especially for PM 2.5 sensing, it's composition agnostic. So what we're doing is counting, uh, counting particles and then comparing them to a concentration. So it's really important as we think about going from Boulder to Los Angeles to Bangkok or to Ghana, um, that we co-locate locally to assess our performance and develop correction factors um, suited to our local compositions. All right, I see one more um, maybe question here relevant to our wildfire piece from uh, Eduardo. Um, so experience about using the low-cost instruments as an early alert system for detecting wildfires. Um, Anybody want to jump on that one, talking just a little bit about how these tools can be combined with kind of the other, whether it's uh, optical systems or other pieces in terms of how we're using these for early warning systems or what's been most effective at your agencies? I think we've uh, used, you know, these low cost instruments um, a lot for doing like forecasting. And so, you know, we're able to you know, kind of track how the smoke is moving and potentially with coupled with like meteorological information, we're able to, you know, kind of predict a little bit like what is it going to be like in the next, you know, 10 hours, right? Or is it in, in addition to, you know, some of the other modeling that we use. So we use that to, you know, ensure that, you know, we have on the ground information that's coupled with modeling, right? Because there's errors in, you know, both of them. And with both, I think you'll, it, gives us a pretty good information. 
Fantastic. Yeah, I really have to say the forecasts, I say, is you know, so credibly important for operational and behavioral. You know, I have data, but what do I do? What do I do tomorrow? How do we plan around these things? All right. Well, I apologize to our um, attendees. We have dozens of questions that I can't probably can't answer all of um, with our panelists with the amount of time we have today. The good part is, is that we have contact information available. I did want to send a humongous thank you once again to Janice, Bill, Jennifer, as well as Nathan. Um, for joining us today. Really, really hugely appreciate your participation um, and presentations, sharing your experiences. And a thank you to all the attendees we have. So we are going to be recording this, or it is recorded at this point, hopefully, um, and we'll be circulating this sometime early next week. But in the meantime, just want to thank you all very much. Please don't hesitate to get in contact with any of us if you have additional questions and very much looking forward to continuing conversation together soon. Until then, wishing everyone a happy Thursday and thanks again.